So welcome to the next edition of the Rare Business Podcast. With me today, I have John Timpson, who is chairman of Timpson's here in the UK. Given that I have listeners in the US as well as the UK, and you're very much a UK kind of business, could you introduce yourself? Tell us a bit about yourself and Timpson's, yeah. where it's come from. Well, it's quite difficult for people from any other part of the world to quite understand what sort of business we've got, because there, there isn't anything like it. Yes. There's one called Mr. Minute, which was a global thing of mm-hmm. which we bought the UK part, which isn't far away, but there, there isn't a true multi-service business of our type. Mm-hmm. Certainly, I mean, you'd, you'd think that there would be in the USA, but yep. there certainly isn't. I've been there, I've, I've looked right. at all the possible things that change. Uh, the whole of dry cleaning, as well as uh, the shoe repair kick, I think, is done by what they call mama papa businesses. Right. It's all, well, all independent. So, wow. okay. so it's quite difficult to describe it. But, but what we are is a, a multi-service business on the high street. Also, we operate in supermarkets. Mm-hmm. It's When I say on the high street, it's not in the back streets. It tends to be in fairly high profile positions, but mm-hmm. we don't need much space, no, so no. we don't need to pay much rent. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there's, no, there's never too many people as far as uh, colleagues in the shops. Mm-hmm. We tend to run it very tight, so yep. we find one or two people in each. Yep. And they're all multitask. They can they can do all the jobs in there, shoe repairs, key cutting, and big mistakes some people will make is they go in and they find, find a very... Uh, attractive lady behind the counter and they say well isn't the shoe repairer here well I can tell you she is the shoe repairer <laughs> because uh, we've got loads of uh, girls and boys as long as they've got personality they're, they're for us Fantastic. Uh, and uh, we operate only in the UK apart from seven shops in Southern Ireland and we are now operating through 1400 different outlets Fantastic. family business as well totally family business we are we a own. bit of an up and down sort of history. Well, sort of it, it hasn't always been a family business. We had a period of, from 1972 to 1983, when it was not a family business at all, mm-hmm. because we had a, a massive boardroom bust up between my father and an uncle who forced him out, got all the other board on his side. So we sold out our shares. We became part of a, a big retail group, mm-hmm. which no longer exist because uh, 11 years after that they they were bought out by an even bigger group Hanson yeah. Trust yeah. which again Trust. no longer exists yeah. because people these groups get bigger and bigger and then they sort of explode or sort of and we did we bought the business I did letter management buy out from, from them uh, from them and I had an extraordinary piece of luck in that the uh there was a bit of a mistake in the negotiations. Mm-hmm. Where there was a misunderstanding about the intercompany balances, which suddenly discovered after basically we'd shaken hands on the heads of terms, and uh, that put us four million pounds better off than we thought we were going to be. Fantastic. So, uh, so I was. Uh, you had a fair win with me. So I was able to go to the venture capitalists who would normally, in those circumstances, give you twelve twelve and a half percent ratcheting up to twenty five if you were absolutely superb in your performance mm-hmm. and I got 80% for the management and uh, I kept over 50% for myself. Splendid. Um, but that, those days it was mainly a shoe shop business and what, and, and there was only the nucleus of what we have now. Yeah. And then four years later I, I sold the shoe shops which were heading for a loss, kept this strange little shoe repair thing and uh, then somehow the shoe repair thing we moved into the office we are mm-hmm. at now and that was 140 shops making 400,000 a year I had a slightly bigger percentage I had 65 percent and a few years later I bought out all the other shareholders it was uh, and so I've had 100 percent of the business or the family has what well, I have really since 1991 and uh, we're now in a situation where we have still have no other shareholders but nor do we have any any borrowings? We don't have any mortgages. We just have some money in the bank. And you and you you continue on the acquisition sort of trail and expanding, yeah. expanding, yeah. The, yeah. expanding and we, the shops. We've got a, we've we continue to have more. It's amazing. Every year, you seem to there seems to be more opportunities to turn up. Fantastic. And, uh, and we've now generally able to uh, 
by and uh, sort of bri by the business and bring it up to our standard. Mm -hmm. uh, invest a fair bit of money without having to uh, go into the red at the bank. Fantastic. So, um, so I was in the audience recently when you spoke at a recent employee engagement summit. I think it was on the. Uh, 15th, 14th of April, I think, perhaps. Could be. Fair right. so fair they're, 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 they're about yeah. I forget the dates. And you, do, you, you <coughs> gave a talk and you were describing the Timpson story and, and also the approach, and particularly the, the upside down management approach, which is articulated so, so well. I wrote a book about it. And you wrote a book about it. About <laughs> it. Um, and I read the book, and actually, I should say for the for the audiences that I have uh, this isn't a conflict of interest, but I have history with Timpsons because that was my first Saturday job I worked for Timpsons. Yep. Yep. Um, but can you tell me about upside down management and what does it mean? Where did it come from? Well, well let's start with where it came from. Okay. I, it came from basically uh, you're always searching as to how you can do better. Sure. And uh, I, I had suddenly realised that a competitor I thought I was going to acquire was uh, uh, that had been taken over by a Swiss bank. Uh, and I went to try and see whether they'd sell me the UK part of this business mm -hmm. uh, and I they quickly told me that uh, they were uh, experts at buying family businesses which is this other one had been <laughs> and putting in professional management and that I was very much on their list uh, which I mean it sort of made you think because you've got a suddenly I got a competitor instead of an acquisition opportunity yeah and that competitor got an awful lot of money so they could have opened up next to our shops or pinched our best people or cut our prices and and against that all you can do is be bloody good at doing the job I mm -hmm. mean, in our terms that means making sure that all the colleagues in the branches turn out a really good technical job sure. uh, and also the customers leave happy enough to come back again yeah uh, and it was um, this thought I suddenly led me to suddenly realize that the only way to create a fantastic level of service isn't by a set of rules, didn't have one of these uh, campaigns for better service or yeah. put loads of notices in the back room telling what people want to do. It's simple. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is to trust the people who serve the customers to do it the way they want. Perfect. And that was it. I should, I had read that some three years before and never really lodged in my mind because I read about Nordstrom in the States, department store. Yeah, yeah. Great service business had wonderful stories of sales clerks literally going, going the extra mile out of there, going spending yeah. weekends helping customers, all that sort of stuff. And the thing I'd forgotten and suddenly remembered is in the middle of that book there was a management chart that was upside, upside down. Right. Okay. Which made the point that the people who really made the money and ran the business are the people who served the customers, mm -hmm. and everyone else working in that organisation must be there and, and are to support the people and are subordinate to that in, in many ways yeah yeah so that's why the management chart has the people who serve the customer at the top and the chairman at the bottom and i thought that's what we're going to do Fantastic. and uh, so uh and we've done that ever since the first five years was it took five years to get it going really uh, okay middle management didn't really sort of get it mm -hmm. they thought the old way was better they like giving orders, they like telling people what to do, and they were saying, how can I be responsible for my area if I can't tell my people what to do? If they can swan off doing their own thing, <laughs> I can't be held responsible. But uh, they got it in the end, uh, because actually running a business this way is much more interesting, apart from being more successful. Sure. Uh, and I also realized when we were going through this thing that the, the idea of the freedom that I was giving the people at the shop floor, mm -hmm. I could also do to everyone else, because an area manager, as far as I'm concerned, can run his area or her area in any way they wish, sure. as long yeah. as they allow the colleagues in their team to do their job the way they want. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. so we, we've, it's just got stronger and stronger as we've gone along. And are you still iterating around that? Sort of still learning all all, all of the time. Do you have a, yeah, a way I mean, of reviewing? Well, I mean, that? a lot a lot of it. I mean, we we grow we're growing very rapidly as a business. I mean, we now as I say we had 140 shops in when we moved into uh, 
this office here in 1987. We've now got 10 times that. Well, yeah. we haven't. We've just made another acquisition, so we're on to 12 times that, or yeah. whatever it is. So we're o over 1,500 outlets now. Uh, but uh, so there's lots of you know, new people coming. Every time we make an acquisition, we've got a big, a ma major program of explaining to them, this is what we do. This is, this is what you can do. Yeah. And it's not easy to persuade people that they've got the freedom that's re that's really interesting because I know that the, the the you've you've grown by sort of both organically and also through acquisition and then the, it's the the if you like the changeover particularly in the acquisition kind of part of that and I, I would assume that's the the hardest part because you've almost got to get people to trust you change yeah. mindsets oh, all oh. those different sort of things no. and is that just done through a explaining and education or is that also a, more of a, a function of we just got to show up and do the things the way we do, and just show them that this is that that it's not all, it's not just talk. Well, well, more the latter. I mean, you, one thing, sir, if you buy a new, another business, I will guarantee that the colleagues in that business won't trust you. Yeah, uh, because either uh, I mean they they've been sold by someone else who mm. either let them down and they think the next one will do exactly the same. Sure, uh, are they are they? And anyway, they have this model of what management's like, and, and it's a this and us and them situation. So, yeah. so it traditionally in a business, the role of the the shop floor is to complain about the people in the office because they haven't got a clue what they're going and vice versa. Doing. And uh, quite often they're right. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so w we're seen as just another management team, mm -hmm. but it depends. Usually, what we have to do is to put our people into the day-to-day -day management, like the area management yep. team would become our management. Because our people have, every one of, every one of the colleagues who work for us in the area teams running the, the field side of thing started as a, an apprentice. They've all been brought up our way. I don't take anyone from outside. So suddenly I get involved with a total business from outside. Yep. So I've got a massive job of explaining it. but. Uh, I mean, we have like we we have just literally acquired this new uh, 150 shops this week, mm -hmm. and fortunately there has to be a consultation period between that company, yep. of Morrison's, and their their colleagues mm -hmm. for, for a month, which gives us the time just to go around and communicate. They've already started, right? And we just say, go and have a look at our website. Don't just which is just about what we do. Mm -hmm. And it tells you that we do have holiday homes that you can go. And, uh, wow, you get your birthday off. You, I mean, and they they start by being worried about the things they can't have anymore, like the discount that they were getting from their yep. previous business and the pension scheme they're in, which might be different. And then they start to see that it's not only you get all that, but you get also get more. Yeah, but the one thing that is in the end, and I was talking to. I was talking to someone yesterday who joined us two years ago when we bought this Tesco photo business. Mm -hmm. a very similar acquisition. And and she said, you know what? I was with Tesco for 15 years. Mm -hmm. And I've been so happy for the last two. <laughs> I didn't realize what I was missing. Right. Because I'm trusted to get on with it. And that's, it takes some time to get the message through. But once they... Once they get it, as long as they got the right, right personality. And that's well, I was going to I was going to come on to that yeah. because that's the thing is that they, I mean, there's there's a lot of talk. I mean, you can read oodles and oodles of stuff, and people go, yeah, we can have hire for attitude and train for skill, and then you go, but do you really? Mm. And then I heard you talk about how you do it and, and things, and and actually, I think you do hire for attitude. Well, actually, you don't hire for attitude. You hire for personality. Personality, yeah. And then train. Well, attitude is part of the personality. Yes. Yeah. But it's like, but it's a, there's a, it's quite a, um, <coughs> it's a very visual and very sort of story led sort of approach to it. So I, I'd be fascinated if you could tell me a little bit more about what you do, how you do it, and, and how did you get to the, the characters that you use? Well, I had this problem. I mean, set off on the upside down management thing. Yeah. And I realized that it only works with the right people. Mm -hmm. And the people it worked with were people with great personality. Sure. Uh, but the real problem was that my uh, area teams who did the recruitment were looking for shoe repairers and key cutters. Mm -hmm. 
what late, latterly watch repairers. And I didn't really want them. Because if the very skillful, qualified shoe repair was in actually fact a grumpy cobbler, he would do me more harm than good. I wouldn't be able to change his personality. Yeah. But if I get the right personality, I can teach them to be a great shoe repairer. Sure. So uh, it was really a question of how did I get that message across. Yeah. And it's about the one, one of the few things in what we do that I, I totally kept claim credit for. Because I was going down, I, I was going down to London on the train with uh, not the son, not my son James is in the business, but my son Edward, who's a politician. Yes. And, uh, a long time ago, I think he was between school and university. Right. right. And uh, suddenly started to doodle on the train and came up with this idea. I've got to show them what personality looks like. Mm. So I started to draw a picture of Mr. Happy and yeah, yeah. Miss, I mean, Miss, Ke Miss Keen and Miss, yeah. Mrs. Punctual and all this and then the others of Mr. Dull and Mr. Slow and so on. Yeah. And I turned that into my uh, interview assessment form which is purely little cartoons of these characters with a box underneath yeah. and I asked the interviewer to quietly tick the boxes that most fit the person in front of them Fantastic. and it worked and I know I've just dug out today the original document, which sort of was my original launch of the whole upside down management thing, which mm -hmm. I wrote in 1998, and the Mr. Men were in there. So Fantastic. it's been been happening now for 18 years. I think I, I think uh, the, what I find really interesting about that is that you've used kind of pictures and the stories that are associated with those kind of pictures because people are familiar, particularly in the UK, with the Mr. Man type of yeah. stories and things, and people make that emotional sort of kind of connection <coughs> with that, and therefore they sort of almost intuitively yeah. understand what it is. They know what Mr. Happy is. They know what Mr. Grumpy yeah. is, and it, it's less of an assessment, as it were, like taking boxes and goes like, no, I've got to feel that that person's like that, mm. and generally. If you're you're trusting your people, then you're trusting their assessment of yeah. how they are, rather than just being about checklists. Yeah, because you can't do this with checklists. No. You can't do it with a process. Nor, nor do I think actually you know, psychometric assessments, all that sort of thing. Really, in the end, it's what you think of that person, mm -hmm. and what you think all your other people are going to think of that person. Sure. And I, and another another version of the Mister Man test, which someone mentioned to me many years ago I've never forgotten is the lunch test okay which is very simply you say to yourself well would I actually look forward to having a three-course lunch with this person which is last for two hours sure and if you couldn't face that then why ask the other colleagues who work in your business to spend eight hours a day with them sure every working day that's that's no, that's a great test mm. it's a great test and I guess you know, we talked about it, so you can't do these things with chest, checklists, and then it's like you, and you the, unbundled and sort of thrown away, discarded a whole bunch of other things around, which would be common practice in many organisations around HR in terms of appraisals and things. And you've decided that actually we don't do that because it's it doesn't fit with that. Well, philosophy. appraisals are an enormous waste of time. I mean, they they take up a lot of not just time but a lot of nervous energy. Sure. In an organisation, which is much better, in my view put to the uh, actual uh, project that you're about to you're, you're meant to be involved in which I guess is all about running the business and the, you know, in the responsibility yeah, that I mean, you're giving I mean, I mean you right. everyone has to do it so then you go along and you, you you say something terribly nice about someone who's useless and you say something about you can improve on this little bit to someone who's almost perfect and you're not doing any good by this and, it, and you, then you have to fill in this form so it can be filed away at HR uh, so we don't, don't bother with that and uh, but I mean, there's a lot of. I'll tell you another similar. Uh, it's nothing to do with HR. No, it's, it's fine. It's the uh, the standard risk assessment thing, yeah. where uh, where you have this uh, rating all these various things and boxes according to the uh, the likelihood of it happening and the the level of risk if it does happen, and you multiply the two, and that gives you the. Yeah, we don't do that. Okay. What I do is every so often, every two or three years. 
I write I write my disaster scenarios. <laughs> right. I dream up all the things that could go dreadfully wrong. Uh -huh. Write a story about it. Do you know that brings it to life? That gets people to talk about the actual things that can happen? Absolutely. Instead of arguing whether that should be a one or a two in terms of its level of risk and that should be three. Or, I, and they never actually, they're too far away from the reality of what happens. Sure. Whereas when I talk about uh, one of our key people being in a plane crash, yeah, then you immediately know you've got to think about management succession. Sure. And uh, if we talk about this big, but I mean, I I've got some very interesting, uh, absolute nightmare scenarios which uh, make you really think that. Uh, well, you have to think long and hard because he brings them to life, and he actually yeah. and, and it actually it's, it's less about the you're not, if you like, objectifying. The uh, a situation you're actually su subjectifying the situation. Yeah. You're making it real. You know, you're thinking if that happened, well, what would what would happen? How would we deal with yeah. it? I, I always try to think of these things being a little bit in the future, so we're not getting too worried about no, it. No, but no. it it makes if you actually, I, I do this on the positive side as well. I do. Yeah. Um, I every three or four years. I, this was the last one two years ago. I write. I write my chairman's annual report for uh -huh. it would be now 2035. Okay. So it's so far away that you can let your imagination run right, which mm -hmm. is what you have to do. Uh -huh. Most forward planning, most forward plans mm. are just uh, an extrapolation of the existing situation. Yeah, exactly. And as long as you make sure that the sales go up faster than the costs, it all looks great. Mm -hmm. They will go away happy, mm -hmm. but that doesn't change the business. No, no, no. You want game changers. Yeah. You want to find the things which are going to completely improve, make a massive difference to your margin, or yeah. are there to replace a big chunk of your business that might be at risk. Yeah. And by looking, whatever we're talking, nineteen years ahead, mm. the mind's able to do it. Yeah, absolutely. I think the um, I, I know that. A number of years ago, I used to work for Shell, and we did. Um, I got exposed to some. They do scenario planning. Mm. It's a similar sort of like thing. They, they they're <coughs> slightly more numerical in their approach, um, but it's the same thing. It's almost imagining imagining what's the art of the possible, yeah. and then you know having all these different scenarios about where things could go and all the different implications, and it allows you to imagine what you could do and how you would respond to it, and what you need to do to change to you know to. Um, to, to keep up as it were yeah. so it's yeah no it's it's uh, what a what a great approach and it's great that you make space to do that because i don't think there's very many modern executives that get the space to think well i have the advantage i don't have a job you see i've got a, i've got a son who does all the day-to-day -day stuff and, you know, <laughs> I, I i could do i do the nice bits i could do the i do the strategy and the communication bit i'm the, also the pr department very good and uh, we don't have a marketing department but if there was i might have something to do with that but, uh, <laughs> So the other thing that we were that you were talking about in the um, in the conference, and it's the thing that uh, I f I found incredibly compelling, was you talked about your work that you've been doing with ex offenders, mm -hmm. and <coughs> I I found it com you know incredibly inspiring because I find that um, there's a I think it's a distinct feeling in society is like when you've been to jail, there is no road back in 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 many ways, and it's almost a bit like what you were, you were telling the story you were telling was showing a completely different sort of view, and going yes, there is a road back, and this is how it uh, you know, how it works. So, I mean, it'd be fantastic if you could just say t tell us a bit about what what you're doing, why you're doing it, and and also um, the sort of results you're achieving because I want people to hear the results that I heard because I just thought. That for me, when I was listening to your your presentation, I was like, going, that's rock star material. It really is. I just thought it was. I mean, hats off. I thought that yeah. was well, incredible. I mean, we got into this by chance, mm -hmm. just because my my son James, who was just at that point starting to run our business as the chief exec, uh, he was visiting a prison for completely different reasons mm -hmm. to organising a function inside the prison, and the guy who showed him around called Matt impressed James so much. He said. Just off the top of that, here's, here's my business card. When you get out, give me a ring, I'll give you a job. Fantastic. And that's how we started. Matt's still with us. It was lucky we started with someone who was going to be successful. Mm -hmm. 
and we decided James uh, myself and his mother we thought well, this, this is something really is worth doing especially when we discovered that over 60 percent of people leaving prison reoffend within two years mm -hmm. but that drops to 19 percent if you've got a job yeah so we we've been doing it for the last 13 years and we've made loads of mistakes and we've We've opened uh, workshops in prisons. We have a workshop in Liverpool prison, a work workshop in Wandsworth, both of which are now closed down because they weren't really the right prisons to open them up. Right. Uh, but we're much better off in, in open prisons. We've still got a big workshop function at uh, Thorn Cross, which is an open prison near Warrington, which, mm -hmm. funny enough, is the place where the whole story started, where James met Matt. Uh, and we've learnt that the best type, best way to start people working for us is while they're still in prison, but coming on the outside during the day. Right. Uh, so so like day release type stuff. They, they call it rotel, released on temporary license, right. which is, yeah. Uh, so yeah, they come out in the morning, they work during the day in our, our shops, and they go through all the apprenticeship, and some, quite a few, become managers before they've left prison. Wow. And uh, that, quite definitely gets that's the best results of all we've learned a lot more about our other colleagues about how generous they can be with their time mm -hmm. I was worried when we started that what would our customers think mm -hmm. what would our other colleagues think sure I've also learned uh, how difficult it is for people leaving prison yeah I'm not surprised they reoffend mm -hmm. because you actually find that for many of them the sentence really starts when they get out mm -hmm. what's the stigma then in, in, in not the, just the stigma you find it difficult to borrow money you can't ah. get an insurance for this so you can't drive a car if you've got a son in australia you can't go there sure uh and quite often your family has deserted you you can't, yeah. you can't see your kids anymore and you've not got a home so the job is the key to getting the life back on track yeah but it also means that a lot of our role is uh, not I could teach them to cut keys and repair shoes that's the easy bit yeah it's helping them get the rest of their life back on track so we get involved with housing and lend them money and all that sort of thing to go to work but we also learned a pretty big lesson which is true to the rest of our business too that it only it, it only works with the right personalities yeah so the same Mr. Smart, Mr. Keen, Mr. Helpful, they're the ones that you want. Yeah. You won't get anywhere yes. with uh, Mr. Crafty and Mr. Dull. And so you're basically Mr. applying the same standards to yeah. you. Could you've, got to, to you've got to apply the same because you can't, uh, there are a third of people in prison who are actually too naughty for you to be able to cope with. Sure. There's probably another third who've got mental health problems, drug mm -hmm. problems, which we can't, we find difficult to put a, a, alongside in the workplace. But mm -hmm. then you've got a third where within those there's going to be a lot of really great people sure so uh, we now have about 350 people in our business about 10% of the workforce who joined us from prison and our rate of reoffending compared with the 60% that uh, is the average and the 19% which is for those who got a job our percent is 3% I think that's amazing so uh, what a great story and it works and we've got some We've got now, we've got two area managers who've joined us from prison, who've gone up the whole thing. Uh, and the guy who runs the whole scheme, the yeah. foundation scheme, who does the selection and looks after people, he joined us from prison. Awesome. So, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's been a, it's been a, I mean, it's done a, a, a company a lot of good. Yeah. Far, far from worrying about c what customers thought, uh, most people, not everybody, but most people say, what a fantastic thing you do. Uh, uh, I couldn't agree more. One of our most difficult things is to persuade other businesses to do the same. Yeah. But, uh, you know, it takes, it takes someone like James, my son, who's created this. Mm -hmm. to, you've got to have that determination sure. to make it work because it, all these things need a helping hand from the top. Yeah. No, absolutely. Uh, which in my structure, of course, is the bottom. But uh, so James is now very much involved. As, uh, he's chairman of the Prison Reform Trust, and he's involved in developing the new reform prisons with uh, with the Justice uh, Ministry. Ministry. So uh, we've uh, 
Yeah, you're busy it, giving the announcements in the Queen's speech there. They were well, I had, yeah, well, James was involved in that, and uh, the uh, ones to do with uh, fostering uh, adoption were, yeah. uh, were actually put in there by his brother. So, uh, busy family, yeah. busy family. So, <coughs> incredible. And yes, I, I, I wish that more businesses would take up sort of similar sort of uh, or take similar approaches or similar take up similar challenges. Um, but then, uh, so a couple of final kind of questions. I mean, so I I write about all this, uh, a lot of the stuff to do with service and experience and people and things, because that's the things that really interest me. But then there's this huge amount of talk right now about sort of data and insights and analytics and all this type of stuff. But given that you run your business very sort of differently, and it's all about upside down management, so a very, very different approach. What advice would you give to a young CEO or an entrepreneur who wants to learn more about their customers and their, their staff? Is it like get buried in the data or? Well, you you don't find much from the figures. I mean, I we've got loads of figures on this business. <laughs> I don't read them very seldom. Yeah. But you, I, I, I pretty well know what they're saying. Yeah. Uh, I gather my information uh, about two days a week, I'm out going around shops, mm. talking to the people. Yeah, I know pretty well where the the only shops I don't know are those that we've opened in the last three or four months that I haven't yep. got to, or yep. we just acquired. And even the ones I've acquired, I've generally been to them before we make make the purchase. Well, like you were saying, there's new acquisition. You'd been to about seventy of the hundred and sixty. Yeah, yeah, because I, you know, and uh, because you have to. I mean, that's, that's what well, it's that sort of feel you get for something. Uh, it, it, yeah, they supply us with some figures, but they, to a certain extent, it does. They only come to life if you you see the place exactly, and you can say, well, I know that's lousy because I was there and I could see that there was a problem with sure. that shop. Or I'm not surprising they're doing well there because there was a buzz about it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you spend a lot of time chatting to the to the people mm -hmm. because you don't make money out of a process. No, you. I mean, it is a big mistake that I think a lot of big organisations, certainly governments, make. Mm -hmm. That all you have to do is to put the right process in place, and they think that managers, they think that ma the management role, is about making sure that everyone sticks to the process. I don't think it is. No. As far as I'm concerned, it's people that make money, not processes. Sure. So management's role is to pick the right personalities and to get rid of the personalities that are no good mm -hmm. quickly yeah, uh, and let them get on with it and do everything possible to help them create the best possible result. It's, it's funny because it, exactly that. My, um, somebody told me a story once and they said, here's a question that, that I learned that he said it's a really, it's a very useful way of looking at things. He said, this is at the end of every day, he said, I find myself asking myself, he said, what have I done today to make the job of my team easier in many ways so, so it's almost like how do I get out of the way how do I remove obstacles how do I kind of yeah. help them C clearing help them obstacles better? out of the way is a good way of expressing it I mean you, you, you've got to make that job job for our people in our shops as easy as possible yeah absolutely and that so a lot of the stuff that our area teams do is like they're like an enormous social service department yeah, yeah. because they are not dealing with the problems in the shop they're dealing with a lot of the problems at home. Yeah. Whether it's debt or divorce or bereavement or all manner of things, what's happening with that. If they can take that pressure off yeah. in terms of being someone to talk to, sometimes lending some money, mm -hmm. just or actually going there and, and, and actually helping some, if someone's mum's died, they don't know what to do. They can actually, tell you what, I'll spend a few hours while you sort out the funeral director or whatever. I mean, I'll stand in for you. That, sorry. yeah, and you—you've made such a major difference to that person, uh, and we get the benefit, of course, of course, when they go back to work. Yeah, absolutely. But, uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, clearing obstacles and get out of the way, yeah, d d get in the way, uh, applies just as much to their home life as it does to work. Fantastic. Um, so you talked about a couple of final, couple of final questions. One is that you talked about this, um, the Timson twenty twenty thirty five sort of vision as it were so what's what do you see <coughs> the future for 
for you know for Timpsons? What where, where are we going? I mean, well, uh, new acquisitions and things. And yeah, but I mean, it, it that's it's easy to look a year ahead or two years ahead because I've got a few more possible things. Sure. See. Yeah. Uh, what we're going to be doing in twenty year time? Who knows? I mean, I I could not have forecast mm -hmm. twenty years ago what we'd be doing now. No. Not the size of the business, where we're doing the business, the way we run the business, it's all evolved. Yeah. In fact, some of the things we do, you could not possibly have guessed, like one of our fastest growing parts of the moment is mobile phone repairs. Okay. So yeah. you couldn't contemplate that no. 20 years ago. Uh, and the pace of change is going quicker. Uh, 20, years, 20 years from now, Half the things that people are using for whatever they do in there have not yet been invented. We sure. haven't got a clue. Yeah. So there's no point in getting too excited. You let you let your mind sort of spread. But one thing I do know is that if we don't change, we won't survive. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's why all the stuff has disappeared and why yeah. you know, all these others go. So we've got we know we have to adapt, but also I'm pretty sure. We have to keep with the same culture. Yes. We still have to pick people with nine who, who rate nine or ten out of ten. Mm -hmm. And we have got. I mean, basically, we'll always be about people providing a service face to face on the high street in the supermarkets or somewhere. Yeah. Uh, because that's what we're good at. Yes. We can apply that to lots of other. I mean, we're doing it for mobile phone repairs. We could do it for goodness knows whatever you're going to use sure. repairs or something whatever the next the next but, thing is but it will be a face to face person i mean the one that we are looking at pretty closely now as a service is uh, all to do with digital identity because we're involved in passport photos um. passport photos are going to move from being a picture on your passport although that would probably still be there. But a lot of it, your identity is going to be online. Well, there's also there's a new uh, application coming out where you're putting your uh, driver's license on an app on a phone. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So all of that. But but right in the centre of that, because we've been we've been working for a couple of years now with all the boffins who mm. have, have worked all this out, this identity, they, they missed one vital point, that to prove that you are you, mm -hmm. I've got to be with you. Uh, you can't sort of do sign, that online. The certifying it, as if, it were. I, if if I can take a picture of you, draw it, doing your signature, putting down your fingerprints, and voice recognition, which is one of the best ways yeah. of distinguishing, if we can, we can only properly <coughs> do that. Yeah. Face to face. So that's one thing we're looking at, and we're also looking at the fact that we believe in actual fact. One of the things we can turn around is at the moment people, people, are, people actually don't like the fact that their identity is being invaded. Yes. Forever, you know, you're being asked to produce utility bills or your passport or every way you turn, you've got to prove yourself. Mm. Well, not just for a passport or a driving license, to get a new job, to be a governor of a school, uh, to take a sports team or whatever yeah, it yeah. might be. Yeah. So what we're trying to do is to get a, a way that we can provide for customers. Once we've got your face-to-face -face identity, we can put all that together in your own personal uh, little thing on the in the cloud. Your, yeah, your, your little, little file or locker your, or something. Your file up there. So only you can access it because you've got the biometrics to do it. But also you can give access to the right bits mm. to get your DBS check done or to prove to the whatever employment agency it is that you've got the right record or so that way you're now in control of your identity yeah and you save an awful lot of time and don't have to keep doing the same thing and you just say press that button and so that's what I'm working on at the moment or well, last two years just sort of floating around that bit I mean, we're starting now because there's a there is a digital passport experiment going on at the moment, and the people are being directed to us to okay. to do it. So, so we are now. We're, you're able to, or just about now, you'll be able to go into our shop and uh, 
put your whole passport application in through our shop. Wow, that's good. So we take the picture, we help you fill in the digital form. And when you start there, then it, everything so, flows off there. So then we start, we've got one or two uh, employment agencies, very interested in what we're doing, got banks interested. and Yeah. So who knows? Wow, fantastic. So the, there's always, uh, but that's just sort of like happening now. But it's almost a bit like, yeah, you, you know that well, we're good at the personal service and we're good at the personal service where people sort of shop either on the high street or in supermarkets or whatever yeah. and it's like some thing, other things in the existing business might change but this is where some mm. things are going yeah. and that's where we can yeah. add value. Of course, one of the problems we've got to solve on this one is that someone's going to say, but you can't have people with a prison rec criminal record doing that. Why? Yeah, well, exactly. Why not? Because every business in the land of any size has got people with a criminal record working for them and they don't know it. Well, yes. <laughs> so, my final my final question, and I always ask these, uh, these questions, uh, this question, and, and I've done what, I've done nearly 180 of these interviews now, mm -hmm. and is this, is there anything that you would like to shamelessly plug? Well, I, I don't have to shamelessly plug anything because uh, we talk about a business and it's my name, so as soon as you introduce <laughs> who I am, I mean, I, I think the best plug I couldn't believe it. It was very recently. Uh, and uh, one of the nicest things that I've been asked to do, in fact, I think like the nicest, apart from getting married, uh, was I did Desert Island Dis. Um, and somebody referred me to that. I have to go listen to it. And this went out very recently on Easter Sunday. People were coming into our shops in their droves saying, I've heard your boss on Desert Island Dis. So, so I don't need to plug the business that much. I think mean, we, we don't advertise, mm -hmm. except I do mention on Devil's Island this, the only advertising I've done in the last 20 years was a scoreboard I bought for Manchester City because yeah. I couldn't see the scoreboard <laughs> and put Timson on it. Uh, but uh, I think in some ways, if I was serious, I'd like to plug the fact that other people can do what we do. Mm -hmm whether it be to do with employing people who come from prison or actually giving their people freedom and run the business and, and avoid process and do it out. But uh, being a bit more frivolous, I was, um, I, I keep writing books and I, I, I'll plug the, the most recent one, which I haven't actually got in front of me, but uh, my re most recent book, which is nothing to do with business at all. Okay. Uh, which is which is out in proof form, just being read by a few sm a small s and select group, ready for it to be published in November. And okay. the the book is titled uh, "How to Lose a, How, How to Make a Small Fortune." How to make a small fortune. There and the subtitle is "The Diary of a Racehorse Owner's Husband," and it's the story of the thirteen years I spent while well, my wife was uh, owning horses and I was the I was the financial director, I suppose, of that particular <laughs> concern, and it's it's a fascinating world. Yes, which I I've tried to write it to introduce non-racing people to understand what goes on, well, and no doubt uh, one or two, two one or two people in racing will uh, either disagree or well, I hope they find it amusing. But uh, well, maybe we maybe I can be so bold and say when it does come out, then let's do another. Another have another chat about that book, and we can help promote the book. Well, thank you, time. thank you. It uh, it'll be probably November because it was going to co coincide with the, I think the big Cheltenham Open meeting, which pretty well launches next season. Because we we're talking about horses that jump fences, yeah, yeah not the, not those that not go on, on the flat. flat. John, um, thank you. It's been a, an honour and a, a and a pleasure. Thank you very much. Good.